Dear Church, I'm standing in front of your local abortion clinic. Behind these walls, thousands of preborn human beings have been dismembered and destroyed by surgical instruments and chemical poisons. From this parking lot, thousands of women have been led to the slaughter to sacrifice their unborn children in a misguided attempt to preserve their own lives. Within these walls works a man who lies in wait for blood, a man who makes the fatherless his prey, a man who profits from the extermination of the weak. Children are murdered here every day, and they've been murdered here since 1974. Let me explain something to you. Every abortion that occurs within this building takes the life of an innocent human being created in the image of your God. Every abortion that takes place within this building murders a baby who has been abandoned by their father, betrayed by their mother, and forsaken by your society. Everyone involved in this practice is your neighbor. And Jesus, whom you call Lord, Lord, weeps. Remember how he said that whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Well, let me make it plain. While you pile into church buildings and sing songs about what a friend you have in Jesus, Jesus is being taken into one of these so-called clinics to be murdered in his mother's womb for less than 30 pieces of silver. Perhaps you live under the impression that these people are not your neighbors. So let me remind you of another story. There was a man on a journey one day who fell among robbers who beat him and left him for dead on the side of the road. Three men passed by. The first two upstanding religious leaders of the day. They avoided him like he wasn't even there. They rushed on to more pressing and primary things. But a third man, however, looked on this wounded stranger with compassion, and he did all that he could to rescue and restore his life. The other men, they were deluded, self-righteous, falsely important people. Sure, they were keeping some other main thing the main thing, but they were bad neighbors. They did not love their fellow man, nor the God in whose image he was made. Professing Christians make up a majority of the people in our culture. And yet our culture permits the slaughter of two unborn human beings every minute of every day. That's 1.6 million children every year. 55 million children since the legalization of child sacrifice. Wake up church. This is going on all around you. And you, you drive by this place of death on your way to worship. So are you not like the priest or the Levite who chose to take the other side of the road? Do you not see that the image of your God is being defiled? Do you not understand that the incarnation of Christ is being demonically debauched behind these doors? Do you not see that your church is at peace with child sacrifice? Maybe you think this isn't the church's mission. Perhaps you believe that caring for abandoned women and fatherless children in your community is of only secondary importance. Perhaps you believe it's the priority of some particular pro-life care ministry. Well, it's not. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Sure, you've created a little culture of life in this culture of death. And you've, you've made a place where you can have your biblical expositions and gospel presentations. A place for you to sing your songs and to have your festivals and functions. All safely behind your freshly painted walls with their flat screen TVs and Thomas King Kate paintings. But have you become so enamored with the things of the world and the program ministries and opportunities at your church that you cannot see that every abortion that takes place within this building denies your great commission. You may think that you are already doing something, and you may be doing something, but do not fool yourself into believing that you are doing all that you can do, or all that you ought to do. Do not delude yourself into believing that this video is for somebody else. I am speaking to you, the evangelical, Bible-believing, theologically orthodox, pro-life church. The least of these are being aborted a stone's throw away from the place you stopped to buy ice cream at on your way home from church. And where is your salt? Where is your light? Pastors, 
Your worship centers are not devoid of sermons on the sanctity of human life. You have not failed to tell your people to love their unborn neighbors or to honor God. But have you considered how blatantly inconsistent your flock is when it comes to keeping these commandments in a culture that kills its children? And have you considered that the failure of your flock might have something to do with the fact that they do what you do rather than what you say? Have you seriously considered whether you are failing to keep the commandments yourself? Or if you haven't, repent. For you have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. And God hates and rejects your festivals, and He takes no delight in your solemn assemblies. He wishes you would stop singing your songs and put away your instruments. He wants you to hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. Wake, Wake up, up, church, for you will not be simply judged for what you have done, but for what you could have done and failed to do. You have not failed to be pro-life. You have failed to be Christian. You have failed to be Christian. The first Christians preached Christ crucified and risen from the dead. But they walked in a manner that was consistent with this teaching. Among other things, they rescued children from the trash heaps and riverways of Rome. They tore down infanticide shrines and they drove off abortionist guilds. They beseeched their emperors to abolish abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia. We live in a similar world today and we're still called to be salt and light. Let us not love in word or talk or simply by our vote. Let us love in deed and in truth. For if our faith is without works, it's dead. And it's time that we remember who we are and know who we are meant to be. Let us understand how far we have fallen and how grievously we have failed. Let us repent and do the works we did at first.